some challenges that we thought to uh, we thought we wouldn't see on uh, on wired networks. So in fact, uh, sometimes my wired network looks like it's behaving a lot more like a uh, like a wireless network um, and a poor one at that. So uh, um, this is uh, this is one of a series of webinars, uh, as Phil has mentioned. And this one this one covers two topics: fragmentation and bit error. And perhaps they're at the more esoteric end of uh, of the scale. We've had things like uh, latency and jitter and loss, which are very much uh, um, uh, core subjects. And um, the first part of this uh, recoups uh, some things that were done on those uh, previous uh, webinar sessions, just so that this one can stand on its own. Um, but I'm not going to cover things in quite as much detail. So if you, if you want to look back at uh, some of the uh, generality of how uh, how uh, TCP and UDP work, um, I shall I shall skimp on that slightly more than uh, before. Um, as, as we know, um, whether we uh, whether we access our services on uh, on uh, laptops or desktops or, or mobile devices, we need to connect to our servers wherever they are. Could be in the cloud these days in some remote data center over uh, a network. And uh, uh, given the range of customers that I currently see, um, these are quite a range of networks. Anything from the internet or a private WAN uh, for some of our customers um, over uh, satcoms um, and other customers possibly with wireless or at least wireless let's maybe as part of uh, the network. So uh, we draw it out pretty simple then, but there could be different hops containing uh, uh, different parts of these. One of the big problems is that when, uh, when testing and developing, um, often uh, we are in an environment with a near perfect network. We're either on a uh, perfect LAN or we're sitting in some virtualized environment where uh, there isn't really a cable. Uh, the LAN is uh, through virtual switches. So there's no competing traffic and uh, that's clearly not the environment the application is going to go and live in in, uh, in real life. So the problem there is that your testing techniques don't really uh, allow you to encounter the kind of problems you're going to see in the network. And as I say, especially in the network today, that's been quite harsh. And I'm starting to see quite a lot of timeouts and things. Uh, so it's not just about delays. So I begin with fragmentation, the first of our topics. It's a pretty obvious uh, uh, definition. Um, fragmentation happens when a packet is simply too large to be transmitted across a particular um, link. Uh, the packet then is broken. I show that uh, I show my packets here as streams of vehicles. I show my large packet three there being split into two components. It might be more than two, but here two, three A and three B. So uh, why would why would that happen? Well, as I said. Um, if the original packet is larger than the, a link's MTU, so MTU meaning maximum transmission unit, then a router which is in front of that link uh, will attempt to fragment it if it can. Um, uh, whether it's successful in being able to fragment it depends on quite a few things. One is uh, whether the don't fragment flag allows it to. If the don't fragment flag is set, it's not allowed to. Or indeed, uh, if you're on IPv6, because on IPv6, you're not strictly speaking allowed to uh, fragment packets. And in IPv6, in fact, uh, um, it is expected that the hosts will determine um, through some discovery processes what the largest packet they can send are. One of the things to bear in mind is that the MTU restriction may not be in the very next uh, uh, link uh, beyond your current network. It may be uh, quite far on through a chain of routers in the, in, in, in your, in the destination of your packet to the target. Um, and so, um, you know, you may not realize that, uh, that that exists there. And that has been especially true with Jumbo Frame. So Jumbo Frame, the definition is a, a, a packet larger than 1500 bytes in size. But often when people talk about Jumbo Frames, they talk about, they talk about packets about 9000 bytes in size. So what that means is that you perfectly, you think I can send them, I know my equipment will deal with them, but somewhere out in the path is some device that won't, uh, and it will either fragment or in the a worst case, I uh, drop them. Okay, moving uh, on to the second of the two topics, bit errors. Uh, I represent again my packets here, and I'm trying to show that my uh, my second packet there has received some uh, bit errors. Um, and uh, so fundamentally, a bit error is when a one in the packet is swapped for a zero or a zero for a one. Um, it could be worse than that. Um, it may be uh, that some of the preamble bits on the packet are lost, in which case um, uh, it can't. It's uh, the the receiver won't necessarily even be able to frame the packet, which turns into an immediate uh, loss of the packet. This is often measured using uh, something called the bit error rate (BER). Um, so that's what that's what I'm talking about here. So um, why why does that occur? Well, 
Um, this now depends very much uh, on the medium you're going across. So if it's, uh, if it's uh, take one that we all know very well, Wi-Fi. Yes, so uh, Wi-Fi might uh, uh, Wi-Fi might encounter some uh, some noise, some electromagnetic interference from some device that transmits on the same frequency. It has been said that microwaves have some leakage on 2.4 gigahertz, which means that 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi uh, can stop working when when microwaves uh, come up and are doing things. There will be interference. In other words, another signal, a valid signal this time, not just noise. Attenuation, that's the amount of signal loss we get when we go through walls or metal beams or other things in the house. There may be bit synchronization problems like timing issues between the receiver and the sender, so it can't quite synchronize, that can lose some bits, and quite a lot more causes of, of bit errors. Bit errors tend to occur most in wireless networks. And we can we can sort of equate satellite as a form of wireless network. It certainly doesn't have any wires, but it can also occur in wired networks. Just the probability, in other words, that bit error rate, um, uh, you know, the probability is going to be very low um, generally in a wireless network. I said this is the part I'm going to gloss over. I've already said. When we want to transmit any amount of data over a network, some large package, it is broken into lots of pieces. I show these here as, as small parcels. I showed them as vehicles on the, uh, uh, on the previous one. There are two principal protocols um, that are used to transport data uh, uh, in the IP family. Uh, TCP, um, a guaranteed protocol, we use that when we want to transmit files and apps or things where we want to transmit segments of data and guarantee they get there. And TCP is used by HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, and everything you see there, and many, many more higher level protocols. So TCP is an OSI, a layer four protocol, um, IP being the layer three protocol that we mostly deal with. And then there's a UDP user data plan protocol. This is a non-guaranteed transport, um, and uh, uh, you, you, you only get an acknowledgement of a retransmission if you program that in to what you do yourself. And that's used by quite a lot of real-time uh, protocols that, frankly, if they waited for an acknowledgement, it'd just all be too late. So this might be uh, voice type protocols like the uh, G.711 and so on, G, G dot family, and the H dot family for video protocols and, and uh, quite a few more. And this, as I said, they're going to be uh, used for real time. In the TCP transport mechanism, an important factor is that um, these are packages of data. You know, my analogy of stream of cars is that we only have to send a certain number of cars before we before we need an acknowledgement from the other end. So we get some bit errors in these. Obviously, it's going to cause some problems uh, and maybe fragmentation as well. The UDP transport mechanism, it's a send it and hope mechanism. I just want you to think about it as being like sending an SMS message. The only time you uh, you know it's got there is if you have an agreement with the other side uh, to answer you, or if there's a natural conversation where the other person is going to answer you anyway. So you, you probably figure they haven't received it if they don't respond. So as I say, that's all the high level protocol. UDP also has no built-in sequence number, uh, which means if something goes missing in the middle, Unless you program in your own sequence number at a layer higher, you don't know. So often people use RTP as their uh, as their transport for real time protocols, which sits on top of UDP and does have a sequence number. So going back to packet fragmentation, first of all, what happens? Well, I was I was quite surprised by some of the things that I uh, researched here for this. First of all, I didn't realise that IPv4 hosts are only required to reassemble uh, fragments up to 576 bytes, clearly an old value. I think these days we would expect and, um, uh, to do everything up to 1500 bytes uh, without issue. So certainly for IPv6 hosts, they are required to, uh, to reassemble um, uh, fragments up to 1500 bytes. So in both of these cases, they can work on larger packets, but they're allowed to throw them away. Um, so, so as I say, um, in both cases, you may want to watch out for jumbo frames greater than 1500 bytes, where it just isn't required that they will um, put um, the host, put the packet back together from the fragments. Um, obviously, any discarding of the packets is going to lead to data loss, which we covered in another one. You're going to get all the factors of data loss uh, if we discard fragments. Um, and we're also going to get some issues if we cannot reassemble the packets. That amounts to a loss. And in multi-path network environments where they don't keep streams going down the same path, so if you have a particular connection stream, it goes on the same path, the fragments themselves may arrive out of order, and the receiver might have to cope with that. 
in TCP-based protocols, um, if, a fra if a single fragment is lost, then the entire uh, packet has to be tra retransmitted. Yes, um, only the whole packet, in fact, is acknowledged, uh, not the fragments. Um, pro protocol protocols layered on TCP um, uh, uh, can experience loss, obviously, uh, all the protocols that I talked about. Uh, and, and that's really what they're going to experience if these fragments don't arrive. And we work with smart TVs that some of the smart TVs for other, certain other embedded devices have very limited TCP. So beware, some of the things you might think they should do, they might not be doing in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, reassembly. And for UDP-based protocols, uh, your, your issues are very similar to TCP, um, but there's no retransmission mechanism. Uh, so, so if you if you lose the fragments, fundamentally it's going to turn into packet loss. Um, so, um, you know, you're going to get your on video your picture blockiness or jumping. Your audio is going to have poor quality as you lose packets. So, fundamentally, as I said, this is exactly the same as I mentioned for loss. Bit errors. Um, first of all, um, at layer two, if you're dealing with uh, protocols for Ethernet and home Wi-Fi is a sort of uh, a, a form of Ethernet. Uh, so what I want to talk about especially, um, normally um, uh, there's no error correction available um, at, at the Ethernet level. If there's a bit error, which means the psychic redundancy last uh, few bytes uh, of the packet are changed, it basically says it, it's going to fail on the receive end and say the packet's not valid. Um, for certain uh, wireless systems, though, and you may have noticed that it, 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 um, uh, packets are retransmitted at layer two. Have you ever wondered why, if you pin your home router, uh, you get uh, you get some quite large uh, values sometimes? How's that possible for a device that's probably no more than uh, you know uh, 20 to 30 feet away from you? You know, so you say um, you know uh, five to 10 meters away from you. How, how is it possible? How could it possibly take five to 10 milliseconds to get a ping back? And why is it so variable? And the answer is the packets are being retransmitted in the background. But for, for most other Ethernet transmission, uh, which is layer two, um, packets are not retransmitted. If the CRT is wrong, they're dropped. And so what that means is that frequently, if you're, if you're operating simplistically, bit errors can simply be treated as loss. Um, satellites and some wireless systems use, uh, use error correction. As in other words, they have some extra bytes in them um, uh, where they can uh, uh, correct a limited number of bit errors. Uh, forward error correction is uh, one example of that. Um, so, so they have a limited amount, so sometimes uh, uh, that they can be fixed. Um, if an error packet somehow uh, gets through and reaches the IP layer, in other words, it's not thrown out at layer two, um, then there are IP and TCP checksums uh, for TCP protocol, IP and UDP checksums uh, for, for UDP. Um, so they can fail and the packet is dropped. But if you're if you're interested, there's an article which was written. It's 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 reasonably old now. It's written in about 2012. And if you Google after this the limitations of Ethernet CRT and TCP checksums, as I said, from No Davids, he has uh, he has a, in his blog um, and he runs through some of the maths of how it is possible that if you have quite a lot of errors, they can kind of compound themselves and uh, the checksum becomes okay again. Um, and he shows that uh, while improbable, it's definitely not impossible, and actually uh, it can happen from time to time. So could you get corrupt data into a database maybe was one of his questions, and I think the answer is yes, you could eventually. Um, TCP itself usually sees bit errors as packet loss. So if, if it can detect a bit error, it's packet loss and you go into retransmission. So retransmission means it's going to be slowed down. You're going to use more bandwidth. Uh, bit errors in Wi-Fi circuits, as I mentioned to you, lead to additional latency and loss. Um, and uh, so excessive uh, bit errors are really going to slow your TCP-based protocols right down. Yeah, uh, for, for, all of, uh, for all of these reasons. So. Um, so it seems that fundamentally um, what we're looking at when we get into fragmentation and, and even bit errors is that they can translate to loss. We've also seen how bit errors can translate to additional latency as well. So at the fundamental level, it can turn through to that. But, uh, but 
often customers, I think in general, um, customers who come for these know exactly who they are and why they're interested uh, in, in looking at these things where their devices, they, may, they feel particularly may be vulnerable to certain uh, things like um, bit errors and, 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 and packet fragmentation. And that often is in things like um, uh, uh, cryptography. So I'm going to go into my walkthrough now, just a little bit on my environment. Um, and this is where, uh, uh, as Phil says, we, 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 we hope that uh, the network will hold up as I go through today. Um, but so I'm going to use a British layout. It's got three pieces. It's my standard layout. If you've watched any of these other um, webinars, uh, it's my three uh, standard layout. I'm in bridge mode. Uh, the product will root. I need to say that. Um, but I'm in bridge mode at the moment, and uh, uh, I've got three PCs with uh, these addresses here. And I've got a server in the same subnet, obviously, because I'm bridging. Uh, so that's uh, that's where we are. So uh, I will uh, press escape, and we'll come out of there. And uh, there we go. So uh, here I am. Uh, this is the this is the any one um, which uh, um, you've uh, you've seen in other webinars. I've logged on. I'm on the home screen, uh, and uh, and here are some emulation. And uh, in order to save time and stop any keying errors, uh, I'm just going to open. Uh, I'm going to open first of all the one mark fragmentation by uh, double clicking it. Uh, I'm going to load it into the port pair 01. I tested this all out earlier, so it warns me uh, there's a configuration already in there. So. Um, I just want to look uh, at fragmentation. So basically, uh, when you start with the ME1, and some of you have seen it, you, you are generally on the basic screen um, here. Um, but you'll notice that basic screen tends to deal with those primary parameters, bandwidth control, uh, congestion, latency, and loss. So you definitely need to be in advanced mode in order to be dealing with um, both fragmentation and bit errors. So it's easy. You just click your link through to advanced and you can see. So here's the two directions. I'm uh, I'm dealing with the downlink direction. That's the one coming from the, uh, the, the server PC back to me, so which which is right port to left port, here's the, here's the other uh, direction. And you can see um, what we've got for fragmentation, we have we have one, um, we have one um, uh, a choice of algorithm that's simply called fragment MTU. And it, it has uh, a parameter, which is the MTU limit. Uh, by default, that would be set to zero, meaning we are not policing MTU. Um, so at 1,000, we will only allow 1,000 byte packets uh, to go through. Um, and you get a choice um, because we were asked. The default um, uh, uh, behavior is if the don't fragment bit is set in the packet, as I mentioned to you, a normal router will obey that instruction. And if you're not allowed to fragment it, it will drop it instead rather than fragmenting it. But you get a choice in the uh, uh, in the any one uh, to fragment it anyway. In other words, really ignore the fact you've been asked not to fragment it, uh, and uh, or to pass the packet. Yes, in other words, ignoring the MTU limit and see what happens down the road. Um, so as I said, they beat those parameters like many of the ones in the product were because they're from customer request. As I say, dropping the packet would be the normal thing to do. And what that would mean is a big packet would be split into fragments and you could then use that to test your uh, your thing. We have a limited number of times. So I'm actually going to demonstrate um, bit error rather than that. But that's where fragmentation, that's where fragmentation is. If I go back to home uh, here and uh, load my uh, load my bit error uh, example uh, here, then again, just to avoid any typing things, I'll put the bit error again uh, on the downlink, and you can see I've checked it. For any of the advanced parameters, do remember, uh, you can see these items are not checked. So if I went into duplication, for example, you do have to check this. And this is just a, a part of the product's optimization that if you don't check this, it says there's no moving going on, no duplication. So the same is true for bit error. So when I did this, uh, when I went into bit error, you have to check um, the bit error thing, and then it will obey this. So for bit error, there are in fact, I know this is going to sound really weird, but there are four choices of bit error. I know you're going to say there are only three. There's this one called error with burst. It's the one I'm going to use for my demo. It's an error rate, so we're going to error one in 7,000 bits. These other parameters control the deviation. In other words, will we allow it to vary from exactly one in 7,000? Uh, uh, will there be a burst level? In other words, some higher level of bit error indicating that some noise crept in? Uh, and, and how often will the bursts occur? 
uh, here um, and, and how random is that interval so you can have a deviation to that interval as well and how long will the burst last so it's quite a sophisticated routine you can just use it uh, you can just use it in its simplest form which is a bit error rate there's also um, there's also here Poisson error um, so if you if you're into the Poisson distribution you'll know that sets a certain amount of big errors you know on the Poisson on a Poisson basis lambda being the uh, the mean of the Poisson distribution and then we've got random packet error which means we're not going to uh, count a number of bits we're going to put a random bit in on a certain percentage of packets I mentioned to you once we've errored this packet, the chances are some piece of equipment will throw it away because it will fail a checksum. But just in case, we've got one of those ourselves. And it's this one here called Packet Error uh, 1 in X bits. I know it sits in the loss category because it's directly a loss function. So here you set a percentage of the packet that will have a bit error. Um, uh, uh, sorry, you, not the percentage, rather, you set your bit error rate the same as we did just now, uh, like 7,000, but we immediately throw the packet away for you. In other words, we pretend that we were someone who was checking that packet out, but it is based on a bit error rate. So it's a loss function based on a bit error rate. So the moment the packet is errored, we also throw it away. But I'm going to stick with this one here, bit error. Um, error with burst here, and we're going to we're going to get it going. So I'm going to say OK to this. I'm going to say OK to this, um, and the emulation will start. And so our pings go through. But sure enough, um, sure enough, uh, we are going to lose some pings, as you'll see. Yeah, why? Because. These pings here, this is a 64 byte ping, so, so, so that's uh, 64 times 8 bits. And so there's a reasonable chance of with 1 in 6,000 bits, by the way, it's a pretty high error rate um, uh, in bit terms, but you'll see that those bit errors are striking these packets, and of course their checksums are wrong, and, uh, and it amounts to a loss. What about this last one? Uh, we're losing everything here, and I just want to show you. So this is a special ping I've set up for Windows with a size of 1400 bytes, which means it's 1400 times 8 bits. And you'll work out that's pretty close to my bit error rate. So what's happening is um, uh, the chances are that um, uh, the, errors will, the errors will strike every single packet somewhere in the packet just uh, on that basis. And they're not random. In this case, I haven't randomized the errors. So fundamentally, uh, the packets are now so large. And that gives us an additional clue that the larger the packet is, the more likely it is to suffer a bit error um, because it's just got so many bits in it. So uh, there, there's sort of where the one. So um, I, uh, I, I turned capture on when I set this up, and I, I'm capturing from the left port. Um, and I could show you that, but I actually captured one earlier, and it was fantastic. So, uh, so I was going to do a, a, a live version, and we are certainly capturing. But here's here's one I um, here's one I captured earlier uh, from uh, from the bit error. Um, here we go. Um, oh, nope, uh, it's the it's the next one to that. There we go. There we go. Um, so, so this is a capture I did earlier, and you'll see packet 77 is in black. Um, so I clicked, so I've clicked on it there um, to find out what's wrong, and you can see, um, you can see um, what is wrong. Let's go. Well, there's a problem with the Internet Protocol um, header, and it says uh, the header checksum failed. Um, it's uh, so the checksum of uh, 41E3 is incorrect. Um, it should be 42E3. Okay, so that's uh, that feels like there was a single bit in there. Um, but here's here's what I think made it really fantastic. Uh, here's um, uh, the outbound ping. You can see just above it. Uh, it's uh, it's 192.165.2 pinging 192.165.100. Yes, but notice what came back. Uh, uh, the answer is uh, the destination is 192.168.5.2. That's the reply ping, and it's to four. It's from 4.100. And I picked this packet out exactly because the bit error occurred in the source IP address. That was just luck, but it was so fantastic to see because you actually get to visualise a bit error rather than it being something esoteric. So it struck the header and modified the IP address, which could of course mean in some cases. Um, that um, that if, if there was no checksum performed, uh, if, for example, in a router, that you might route to the wrong address. Of course, the checksum hopefully is performed and the packet is detected, because otherwise it's going to be sent 
to the wrong place. So um, that really is all I wanted to show there. Uh, so I'm going to um, return to Phil. I'm going to uh, slide the slide. Uh, restart the slide presentation there, and Phil, back to you for for any questions that uh, may have arrived in the uh, in the panel. Thank you, Frank. Um, in fact, I'm just looking at the panel. Um, no, I do not see any questions in there. I am conscious that we are slightly running over. So, um, unless there's anything else that you wanted to, to add yourself, Frank, um, I think uh, no, uh, no, no questions. No thanks, Phil. Um, no, thanks, Phil. I'm I I I'm all set. Um, I, it's just really to re, to reiterate again. Um, you know, if you if you are if you if you're asking yourself why would I use bit errors and why would I use fragmentation, the chances are that they aren't important in what you do because uh, for for people who for people who know when they are important, they absolutely they come and they ask us about these things. But uh, um, they are. That's all. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, so this actually concludes our um, session, uh, refresher sessions that we started running back in January. Uh, seems a long time ago now. Um, the first three really focused on how to use the the, network, the any one network emulator. We then started looking more towards um, network impairments, and obviously we drilled down in more detail into some of the things like latency, packet loss, duplication. Obviously, today fragmentation and bit error. Um, all these recordings are available on the training site. So if you use the URL there, you'll be able to to watch those at your leisure. And so that really concludes this current session um, regarding the any one. However, we do have two new ones in the pipeline. Um, the next one will be looking at the anyone's big brother, uh, the INE, and we've got some very exciting announcements coming up regarding version nine. Uh, we've scheduled a date for that for Wednesday, the 6th of May. Um, it says that you can register. We are a little bit premature in making that statement. Um, it's not live on the site yet, but we will make it so in the next couple of days and we will be sending out emails advising you when that's available for registration. Similarly with the NE1, uh, we now come to version five. Again, there's some, some very significant um, announcements to be made around that. And we've scheduled that date for the following Wednesday, the 13th. And again, we will send out communications regarding how you can register for that particular one. Just a final reminder in terms of the anyone itself. Um, as ever, a reminder that there are 11 video tutorials built into the product, which will help guide you through how to use it. Uh, and again, we have the manuals on the anyone page. Um, and in addition to being on the training page, um, the, all these videos are on our YouTube channel. So really, it can, nothing further to say, but just to thank Frank for the presentation, thanking you all for joining us today. Um, and as I said, hopefully we will look forward to joining when we have our next sessions. So many thanks indeed. Thank you.